Speaking of recording, <laughs> okay, uh, we then, who are strong and should bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves, but let every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification or building up. We should be building up our neighbors. We should be teaching others of the, the meaning of the scripture, bringing people to Christ. That's what our job is. And Paul is referring back to our previous study, those of you who were here last week, speak, when speaking of the strong and the weak. It, it, it's talking uh, metaphorically that the, the strong are seasoned Christians, Christians who have been reading and studying uh, for a long time, and the weak are new Christians, and, and he doesn't mean that in a bad way, but we have strong and we have weak. And he tells us to bear the infirmities of the weak and, and, not, and, and not please ourselves. Don't get the big head. Oh boy, I, I, I taught Rod uh, last week. I, I showed him, boy, his, his understanding was all wrong. And, and uh, man, you know, and, and Paul says, don't do that. Um, he, he refers back to his comments in the last chapter about not arguing just to prove yourself right. Uh, which is what pleasing ourselves seems to refer to. And I used to be really bad about that. Fortunately, you know, 20 years have gone by since I was, since I was that way. But I, I used to, for some reason, I had to convince you that what I was saying was right. And you had to agree with me. And I beat you over the head with it till you did or till you left and wouldn't have anything to do with me, which is what happened about 85% of the time. <clears throat> and Paul says here, to edify your neighbor, to build up, strengthen, give them knowledge. In verse, my clicker's not working. Verse three, for even Christ did not please himself, which is an interesting comment. We'll come back, back to that in a second. Even Christ pleased not himself, but, as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached you fell on me. Christ didn't please himself. Does anybody want to take a stab at what he, what, what he might have been talking about here? Well, here's what I think. I believe that when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane that, that last night, right after he observed the Lord's Supper, he he prayed, as we all know, that the cup would pass from him. He prayed that he wouldn't have to go through with it. He knew that he was about to go through the most painful thing that a human being could go through, scourging, crucifying, uh, and, the, and the mental... Uh, uh, problems that, that he was going to have to go through. And he prayed that he wouldn't have to suffer and die. Well, who could blame him? But he prayed that God's will be done, not his. And here's part of what he said. He withdrew from them, the, the, the disciples, a, a, about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and he began to pray. And he said, Father, if you are willing, if it's okay, if there's some other way, remove this cup from me. I don't want to die this horrible death if I don't have to. Is there any other way to do this? And then you can kind of see that God answered him and said, no, son, this is it. And, and Christ said, okay, not my will, but yours be done. He did not please himself. Had he pleased himself, he would have said, you know, Father, you know, sorry, I'm not going to do this. You got to figure out some other way to, to do this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing it. We are fortunate that Christ did not please himself. Verse four. 
for whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning. And he's talking about the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, get that, patience and comfort of the scriptures and the only scriptures they had were the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. But we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now, what was it? What scriptures was he talking about? Well, here's where uh, uh, the Apostle John wrote something very similar. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And you do. And he says, it, John says, it is these that testify about me. And then Timothy, and we're all familiar with this one, I think, where, where Paul tells Timothy, from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Salvation is in the Old Testament. Salvation is in the Hebrew scriptures. We, okay, from a child, Timothy, you've, you've studied the scriptures. You know the scriptures, and they're able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Paul's talking about the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, now, it, it's believed that Timothy was about 16 years old when Paul wrote this letter to him. It's, it's called a pastoral uh, epistle, uh, a letter to a pastor. So from a child would refer to Timothy maybe being 8 to 12 um, years old. Uh, and that would make it somewhere between 42 and 46 A.D., now, these are estimates, of course. Now, think on this. Matthew was written about 65 A.D. Okay? Think on that. 65 A.D., 65 years, well, about 68 years after Jesus Christ was born. Mark was written about 60 A.D. John, about 85 A.D. John wrote his letter and, and the the you know, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and the book of Revelation much later than the other letters and books were written. Paul's first epistle, which was 1st Thessalonians, was written about 50 A.D. So he's, he's telling Timothy, you know, you've been studying this stuff your whole life, son. And so that would mean that, that none of the Gospels were written before Timothy was maybe 25 or 26 years old. Far from being the child that Paul spoke of. Now, the first canonized letter in the Greek scriptures, which is 1 Thessalonians, as, as I understand the, the sequence of, of books that were canonized, it was written about 20 years after Jesus Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, of course. The New Testament church only had the Hebrew scriptures to study for many years before the gospel, gospels and the epistles were written. And after that, they were just writings being passed around. They were not, you know, I mean, they were letters written by Paul or they were letters written by, you know, a book written by uh, John or, or, you know, they were important, but they weren't, maybe weren't considered scriptures yet. You know, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. I'm not 100% sure on that. And, and by the way, uh, for anybody who hadn't been here <clears throat> before, we use the term, the phrase, I don't know, or we don't know quite a bit. It's okay to not know. Doesn't bother me at all to say I don't know. And, and I know uh, most everybody on here is, is fine with that. We, many, many years ago, were in a church and, and we couldn't do that. We just couldn't make ourselves. We always had to have a, an answer. The ministry had to have an answer for everything. And we've, we've grown since then. And we found out, hey, guess what? 
There are things we don't know. Verse 5. Now, the God of patience and consolation, okay, so there's two of the characteristics of God, of the Father. The God of patience and consolation. And aren't we, aren't we fortunate that God is patient, that he hadn't wiped us all out and started over again like he told Moses he was going to do one time? Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another. Now, that does not mean, by the way, 100% agreement. That doesn't mean we all have to be yellow pencils. What that means is that we are generally in agreement with each other. We are certainly in agreement on the big things. But we don't agree 100% on everything. And so what we do, Rod and I are talking about uh, whatever. And I'll say, well, Rod, here's, here's how I see this. I see it as meaning this right here. And Rod says back to me, well, I don't really see it that way, Skip. I see it this way. And then we move on. We don't go to the, yeah, but, well, yeah, but. You know, that's where the argument starts in, and that's where the discussion starts going backwards. And so when we're talking with one another, we need to simply state our opinions and then and then move on if, if it's at all possible. So anyway, now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. He's commanded us to get along. Verse 6, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we, 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 we find in, in chapter 14 when Paul mentions being like-minded toward Christ, uh, as I said, he, he doesn't mean all of us have to believe exactly the same things. He gave examples in, in the previous chapter of, of a person who, one person would eat meat that may have been sacrificed to an idol. That same person, I mean, a, a, a friend might not eat meat that had been sacrificed or that might have been sacrificed to an idol. Paul made it real clear that an idol is nothing. Hey, Skip. Yeah, Rod. Uh, I want to go back one verse to to four to. Uh, okay, yeah, that one. No. There, that one. Um, I'm going to throw something out for us to think about uh, in how we read something, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith. Stop. Right there. It says, make you wise unto salvation through faith. That's, that, that, that could be a complete sentence. True. And then he says, which is in Christ Jesus. So, Did Timothy, is he telling Timothy uh, that it's through Christ Jesus? In other words, you you know that you get faith through, the, through you know, uh, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, period. And, but he goes on and says, which is in Jesus Christ, as if Timothy did not know that. That's what I'm trying to throw out. That, that 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 comes through uh, Jesus Christ and how much, you know, like he said, he'd studied scriptures all of his life, but he's trying to make him uh, understand something a little further, which is, which comes from Jesus Christ. So I don't know. It's just something to throw out there, how much Timothy actually understood versus some of the things that Paul tells him. 
Yeah, I mean, I could see how maybe if you were only given the scriptures, if you're only given, you know, all of these understandings and indicators um, of how to gain salvation uh, through law observance, I mean, the idea is that you probably are drawn to focusing only on that, um, that you, you get into legalism very easily. And I think Paul was trying to nip that in the bud immediately after something like that would have been a natural conclusion, Rod, you know, um, that, yeah. hold on. It's, it's, it, it, and, and uh, you know, it's wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus. Uh, so I think, yeah. uh, I think that was, you know, probably Paul knew that was where his growth was going. Where his thoughts were going. Yeah. I think you're right that you could stop the sentence right there at, at faith. I mean, how are we saved? We're saved by grace through faith, right? And mm -hmm. who's the faith in that we are saved through? It's faith in Christ, that we've accepted Christ as our Savior, as our, you know, his blood has paid the penalty for our sins. Uh, you know, all the things that have to do with Jesus Christ that's what our faith is, and that's what saves us, um, is, our, is our faith in Christ. And then, you know, then there are things that you're going to want to do to obey God and so on. But I, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it seems like, Rod, that, that, that Timothy had been with Paul for like 20 years. And I would think he would have known this. Now, maybe, maybe not. Maybe... Maybe what you're saying is is absolutely right, um, but it is a good point. Okay, ready to go on? Yes. All right. Uh, we did this one. Okay. Let's see, 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 see. Okay. What I what I was saying in 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 this one. Uh, okay. Uh, last chapter, <clears throat> he talked about people who it didn't bother to eat meat that may have been sacrificed to an idol because they knew that an idol was nothing. But another person was a vegetarian because that person was scared to death that he or she might be eating meat that had been sacrificed to an idol and Paul makes it very, very clear, don't do that. Don't put a stumbling block in front of somebody. As we talked last week, if, if I'm, if I'm uh, Diane and I are having dinner with some friends and one of them has had a drinking problem, I'm not going to order a drink. I'm, I'm not, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to order meat sacrifice to an idol. Although I don't know where you get that these days, but anyway, but that's that's what Paul is is talking about, um, and he he doesn't want us to be yellow pencils, though. You know, I'm I'm convinced, and I may be wrong on this, but I am absolutely convinced that when when Paul talks about the body of Christ, that he's talking about. Well, we all know he's talking about the called out ones, the ecclesia, the 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 church, if you if you will. And he's he's talking. Excuse me, I got the hiccups. He's talking. I've lost my train of thought completely. Um, well, maybe it'll come back in a minute. Body of Christ, he's talking thank about. You. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, that's, I, I know, for, for those of you who don't know, Rod and I have been friends since we were about 13 years old, and we're both in our 70s now, early 70s. And that's without a doubt the first time Rod has ever told me something that made sense. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun, Rod. I enjoyed that. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, that's not really true. Rod is the one that led me to uh, this church, to to this, uh, the way that, that I believe these days. So, yeah, Rod has, has done quite a bit for me. But anyway, uh, the body of Christ, 
I, I believe that it, it doesn't just mean what, what some people have told me, that it means that, you know, there are evangelists, there are ministers, there are teachers, there are, you know, and that that's what he means by the body of Christ. I don't believe that, and I'm not getting going to get into a lot of details, but it's like when Elijah was sitting there under the under the little tree and he was uh, in despair because uh, Ahab and, and uh, uh, Rahab, King Ahab and not Rahab. Jezebel. Jezebel, thank you. There's a, two times tonight, right? Uh, were trying to kill him, and, and he said, "I'm the only one here." And and and, and God says to to him, "What? No, there's there's seven thousand people you don't even know about." And I, you know, that's what I think that that Paul's talking about when he talks about the body of Christ. But anyway, uh, I don't think he wants us to be yellow pencils, everybody exactly alike. In verse seven, he says, "Wherefore." You need to receive one another just like Christ received us to the glory of God. So he was, Paul, Paul was talking here about us who have been around a long time, who understand a lot of this stuff, who've been taught by Christ himself in some cases, by the apostles in other cases, by great teachers and so on. Christ received us. Now you receive one another. You receive the new babes in Christ, just like Christ received us to the glory of God. Paul has been speaking of how we should overlook our differences. We must not judge people who think and believe different from us. And you can go wherever you want to go with that one. I don't care. I'm not going to give you my opinion. You need to go wherever that takes you about not judging people who think or believe different from us. In verse 7, he says that we're to receive each other just like Christ received us. And how did he receive us? He answers that question in the next few verses. I'll get there in just a minute. Uh, Romans 15, 8. For I say that Christ has become a, oops. Nope, I guess I do. Christ has become a servant. The, the King James says minister. That's what the word means. The Greek means servant. Um, Christ has become a servant to the circumcision, to the Jews on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the thought promises given to the fathers, to confirm the promises. God keeps his promises. That's another thing that we said last week. And, and in Genesis, here's one of the promises to Abraham. I will make your seed, your descendants, as the dust of the earth. Well, guess what? When God told him this, he didn't have any children. I will make your seed as the dust of the earth. He was making a promise to Abraham, and Abraham may have been sitting there thinking, well, how is this going to happen? So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then so shall your seed be numbered. It's a physical blessing. Genesis 15, 4, down here at the bottom. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this shall not be your heir. This is... This is the, the word of the Lord telling Abraham that, um, was it Elie, uh, Eleazar? I can't remember the, the boy's name, that was the son of Abraham's servant. This shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. It's going to be your own flesh and blood. And he brought him forth abroad, and he says, look. Look at the stars. How many are up there? And, and, and God said to him, so shall your seed be. Now, one thing, I just want to throw this out. 
says the word of the Lord came to him, word logos, John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was Christ. So I think this is talking about the one who became Christ before he became a human being. I think that's who this may be uh, talking about. Um, Genesis 15, 18, the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your seed have I given this land from, from the Nile to the Euphrates River. And then in Isaiah 9, 6, it says, and this is a prophecy about the birth of Jesus Christ. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father of Prince of Peace. Probably the greatest piece of music ever written was written by Handel. And this is a part of Handel's Messiah. In verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. No end. On the throne of David, which uh, Jesus Christ was a descendant of David, on one side, of course, and on his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment, and with justice, forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Hey, it's going to happen. It is going to happen. Nothing can stop it. There are so many promises about the Messiah given to the fathers uh, that if, if we were to discuss every one of them, it would take us a couple of days. It might take maybe longer. But, but Paul adds here that it's the same for the Gentiles. In Romans 9, 24, we went through this a couple of weeks ago. Even us whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. And he says in Hosea, I will call those, and, and I think we, de we decided that this was actually speaking of, of, of Israel, but that's beside the point. He calls not the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Um, now, let me find. There I am. Okay, Isaiah 66. And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them among the Asians to Tarshish, Pool, Lud, that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan, Javan to the isles afar off that have not heard my name. He's talking about Gentiles who didn't grow up with the word of God. Didn't grow up with men like Gamaliel teaching in the schools in Jerusalem. They've neither seen my glory and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Isaiah 49, 6. Whoa. Well, how about that? I lost it. Okay, let me find out where I am here. Every once in a while, I'll do this. Romans 15, 10. And he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And by the way, those of you who don't uh, have a New, New American Standard version, that's one of the really neat things about the NASB. It capitalizes quotes from the Hebrew scriptures or, or paraphrases. So he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the people praise him. Again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles in him shall the Gentiles hope. Paul's been leading up, I believe, to bringing the language of the Jews and Gentiles into this letter. He began in chapter 14, speaking of the strong and the weak, using metaphors of meat and vegetables. Then he talked about days, which some regard and some don't. And what we talked about was the Roman calendar 
they had, uh, the, the, you know, the first day of, of, the, of the first month was, a, a, you know, an important day and the first day of the sixth month and, and so on. And then the Ides of March, which is about, uh, I think, the 15th day of, 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 of March, which would have been uh, the third month. I'm sorry, the first month. Uh, of the you know based on the Hebrew calendar, and and then and Paul warned us not to judge people who are different from you, from us, and he warned not to put a stumbling block in front of someone. So in chapter 15, the one we're on now, he brings those points into the mix, speaking of and to Jews and Gentiles, saying they are equal. The same exhortations apply to these two groups of people in the church at Rome. Jews would be considered strong because they've grown up worshiping the true God, uh, uh, memorizing the scriptures, learning, uh, probably memorizing uh, the Old Testament to make them wise, it says. And the Gentiles would be considered weak not because they were not as good or whatever, but they would be considered weak for not growing up worshiping the true God and not studying the scriptures. Now, Paul quotes several scriptures from the ones the Jews grew up studying, showing them that God planned all along, from the very beginning, he planned on bringing the whole world See, when, when we talk about Jews and Gentiles, we're talking about every human being. Because if you're not an Israelite, a Jew, if you're not an Israelite, you're a Gentile. And so if he's going to bring this message to Jews and Gentiles, what he's saying is that I'm bringing this message to the whole world, every single human being ever born. Um, he wish, wishes that Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians would get along and love each other and come together to worship God and his son. Verse 13, now the hope, I'm sorry, now the God of hope, this is another one, this is another characteristic of God. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, hope in the scriptures, as and we've talked about this before, those of you who've been on here, hope in the scriptures doesn't mean I hope we win the game Friday night. It means that I know it's going to happen. I have hope that whatever it is, is going to happen. And verse 13 talks about God being the God of hope. He's the one that brings it all about. He's the one that's made our promise, the promises to us. And he says, the God of, of hope fill you with joy and peace because you believe, you know it's gonna happen, that you may abound in a surety through the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, and concerning you, my brethren, I am also convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to warn one another, to admonish one another. Now remember, Paul's never been to Rome. He has written this letter to, in theory, a bunch of strangers but they're not strangers because he knows them, even though he's never met them before. He's writing to them based on what he's been told by either Romans he's met in his travels, because if you remember, he's, he, well, and I'm gonna show you a map in a minute uh, of, of, of Paul's travels, and you can see how many Romans and other Christians Paul would have run into. So. He's, he's been told by either Romans he's met in his travels or by God through the Holy Spirit. And as he winds down this letter, 
he tells them that they are full of goodness and knowledge and character. With that character, they are able to warn one another. Not being judgmental, not lording it over one another. And I know some of us on here have done that. I, I certainly know I have arguing and fighting, not doing that, but admonishing people in love and, and that, that they can correct each other when corrections needed. Don't just walk up to somebody and say, you know, you got a problem and I'm here to fix it. Yeah, that's really going to go over good, isn't it? The word no thetio means to admonish, to warn, to instruct so as to redirect someone from wrong ways and correct his behavior. Paul used a lot of words in his closing of this epistle to the Romans, many more than in any other epistle. It's long. He, he said he did it because he'd never been to Rome. And, and in verses 15 and 16, which we're about to read, he reminds them that he is the apostle to the Gentiles and that he didn't pull any punches in this letter. Now, Rome, in theory, these people were Gentiles, not Jewish. They were Gentiles. Verse 15, nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you as putting you in mind because of the grace that God has given me. God has given me grace to understand you, to put you in my mind so that I can pray for you, so that, so that I can send this letter to you to lead you and to guide you. Verse 16, that I should be the servant of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, serving the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified, set aside for a holy purpose by the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul has been set apart by God through the Holy Spirit to spread the gospel, to serve, to teach, to edify who? The Gentiles. And while he's doing that, he's going to work on the Jews too. And so here's the map. And we can see, look where Paul has gone to teach people. The first journey starts in Antioch right here and is this orange line that goes right over here Oh, that's not, that's not right. I'm sorry. The blue line that comes down to Cyprus. He hit two cities, Salamis and Paphos, and then up to the southern coast of Asia Minor, to Perga, Pamphylia, and then up to Antioch, Pisidia, Lystra, Iconium, and Derbe. So you can see the blue line. All of those people are Gentiles. Now, that didn't mean there weren't Jews in those cities and there were synagogues in many of those cities. Well, that's, that's the first journey that Paul went on, he and Barnabas. But when they came back, when they came back, which is this orange line right here, John Mark, or Mark, the writer of the gospel, left them right here. But uh, this is uh, uh, this is his his return trip without Mark, and he and Barnabas got into it so bad, as I'm sure everybody knows, that 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 was it for a long time. He and and he and Barnabas didn't have anything to do with each other, and he and he and uh, who am I trying to say? Goodness gracious, I forgot already. He and Mark didn't have anything to do with each other for 
a long time. And this purple line here is his third, I'm sorry, second journey. And kind of his third journey too. But anyway, you can see that he goes up to his hometown of Tarsus, where he was born. And then across Cilicia or Cilicia, uh, he, he goes through the, some of the same cities. And then he starts going north. And he gets up in here and he gets a vision from God that says, hey, I, I don't want you going up to Nicaea and, and, and uh, Byzantium. I want you going west. I want you to go over to Philippi, to Macedonia, because they need you. And then you can see that he came uh, through Thessalonica, Berea, on down through Greece. Uh, there's to Athens and over to Corinth. Okay, and then his third journey is actually not on here because this is where he returned. But anyway, you get the point. Paul was everywhere, just about. Romans 15, 15. But on some points, I have written you quite boldly by way of reminding you about them because of the grace God has given me. Oh, I'm, I'm, this is in the complete Jewish Bible, which is a great translation, by the way. To be a servant of the Messiah, Yeshua, for the Gentiles, with the priestly duty of presenting the good news, the gospel of God, so that the Gentiles may be acceptable an acceptable offering made, by, made holy by the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, which, by the way, we will be talking of a lot this Sabbath and Sunday, which is Pentecost. Sunday is Pentecost. 50th day since, basically since uh, the, the, well, not basically, but since the wave offering was, was done, since Christ presented himself to his Father. In verse 19, well, let me do 18, 17. I've done that in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, and I've got a map. That big circle goes from Jerusalem to Illyricum, Illyricum, sorry. And where this era right here is, it's on the west coast of Asia Minor, and it's on the northern part, um, almost, um, no, wait a minute, here's Asia Minor, I apologize. This is where, if I remember right, and I had, I'm sorry, I hadn't looked at this in a while, he was wintering up there. He was tired, if you can imagine all the things that Paul went through. He was tired. And this is right across from Rome, if you notice. Rome's right in here somewhere. This is Italy. You can see the boot. Okay, I'll try to catch up with myself. So as you can see, this area covers the entire area that Paul had been to. And, and he adds in verses 20 and 21 that he hadn't gone where other apostles had gone before him. He believes that the following quote from Isaiah 52 applies to his ministry because he quotes it. He said, I aspired to preach the gospel, but not where others have gone before me so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see. And they who have not heard shall understand. And here's where that scripture comes from, Isaiah 52. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. And this is speaking of God through Paul. He will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told to them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. 
Paul had wanted to visit Rome many, 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 many times, but he was hindered every time until it was time for God to send him to Rome. He had been too busy in reaching the unreached, if you will, to fit Rome into his immediate plans. Rome had been on the itinerary, but again and again and again, the Holy Spirit had directed him otherwise. Verse 22, for this reason, what reason? Because God sent me other places and because God wanted me to tell it to him first. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. And, and here's one of the times when we see him being hindered. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden, forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia, it was on that map while ago I showed you, he was going north and, the, and God through his Holy Spirit said, no, 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 you're not going that way. I want you to turn and go due west and cross the Aegean Sea and uh, go to Macedonia. And in, in Acts 16, 9, here's the vision. The, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed to him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, in verse 23, Paul gives us uh, a little more information. But now, having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, when I take my journey into Spain, and we don't know if he ever did that or not, there is some evidence that he might have, but this is one of those places where we say those three little words. Like what are those three little words? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm surprised you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We don't know whether he went to Spain. I will come to you because it's time. For I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way there, there, thitherward. I love that word. That's a great word. Thitherward. Say that 10 times real fast. Thitherward by you if first I be somewhat filled with your company. Uh, and when he did go to Rome, he went under arrest, handcuffed to a guard, shipwrecked, <laughs> left for dead on an island with all of his uh, companions. And, and with, 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 uh, with some of them trying to get on a lifeboat and take off because their ship was about to break up. And Paul said, no, whoa, hold it. God has told me if any of you guys leave this ship, we're all dead. So they all came back. And sure enough, they were taken to a, a shipwrecked on, on Malta. Uh, safely. Um, okay, so all right, but he, he has another job to do before he goes to Rome, verse 25. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to serve the saints. And if you if you look at the biblical history, there was a uh, a plague and a, and a and a, and a uh, you know starvation and things going on. Verse twenty six. See, for all of this time, for two years, he's been collecting money and 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 things for the poor in Jerusalem, and and here he's finally going to be able to take it back to him. 
For it pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are in Jerusalem. It has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to, to serve to them in carnal or physical things. When therefore I have performed this, when, when I've taken this back to Jerusalem and have sealed to them this fruit, took them food, I will come by you into Spain. Again, we don't know for sure that that's what he did. So Paul plans to get back to Jerusalem to give them the, the money and the, and the food that they've uh, picked up uh, and then head out to, to Rome. Verse 29, and I'm sure that when I come to you, now remember he's writing this letter to the Romans, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now, I beseech you, brethren, I beg you, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Holy Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Please pray for me. But he knows that getting out of Jerusalem is not going to be easy. If you remember, uh, he's been told time after time after time not to go to Jerusalem. Now, he wasn't forbidden by God, but he was told by God what was going to happen to him if he went. But he had a job to do. So he's going to Jerusalem, and they ain't going to stop him, as they say down here in the south. He is hated by the Orthodox Jews in Jerusalem who want him dead. And so he says, I need your prayers that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in that do not believe in Christ who live in Judea that's what that's saying and that my service which i have for Jerusalem may be accepted by the brethren by the saints by the christians that i may come to you in rome with joy by the will of god and may with you be refreshed now that prayer was not answered <laughs> well not exactly answered. He went as a prisoner. He was tied up. He was chained up. But he did come to them with joy and by the will of God. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now that sounds like the conclusion to this letter of Paul to the Romans, but it's not. He has a lot more to say, but we'll cover that next time. Thoughts, comments, corrections? Interesting how he talks about going to Spain um, for me. Um, I know there's some people that believe he did make it to Spain because the Gospels needed to be delivered to the known world at that time. And that's the furthest um, almost the furthest um, west you can go on the map. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that has been something that, not that it doesn't, it doesn't again, it does, it's just chasing rabbits, right? It doesn't really make, make a hill of beans one way or the other, but um, I think that's, um, that's an interesting idea that um, to fulfill the idea that these scriptures were gonna be delivered to all the, the, the known world at that time and then um, thereafter to the entire globe um, is, there, is, is, someone's, is some people's rationale for why he did probably end up making it to Spain. Well, I'm sorry, was somebody else going to say something? There are some missing um, areas, if you will, in the scripture. Um, he all of a sudden shows up here and all of a sudden shows up there uh, a couple of times. And uh, I, 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 I'm like you, Blake. I seem to think that he did get to Spain, but the scriptures don't show it, so we don't teach it. 
you know, it's okay to say, I think, you know, he may have, but you can't, you know, you, you can't close that out as, as our old buddy Ron Dart said. You yeah. Can't, you can't close it out. So, um, the scriptures don't say that he went to Spain. So that's where we, that's where we are. Uh, there was a period of time uh, that he uh, got out of prison in Rome the first time. Uh, the mm -hmm. scriptures talk about two different times. Well, where did he go? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know where he was in those in between years. So anyway, it's it's no big like you say, it's no big deal. Yeah, it's just it, it's interesting. Um, the other thing is that it, it's it's incredible. I, I, I guess I didn't know how how young Timothy was whenever um, Paul wrote these letters to him, but it that's um, startling how young uh, Timothy is, and it and it goes to show that um, Paul wrote this to Timothy under knowing that he would be able to comprehend what he was writing to him. This is some pretty heady stuff that Paul is writing to Timothy. Um, I think of you know some <laughs> some teenagers that if I if I read uh, these letters to them they would they would just their eyes would glaze over um, some of the concepts that he's trying to unpack for Timothy. Um, anyways, just uh, more proof that um, that young people can be given opportunities to lead and to be uh, you know in positions of, of leadership. So. Yeah, and even even a bigger thing than than that is that that Paul put him in charge of the church in Ephesus, which if, if you if you look at at the area and you look at the churches that were around Ephesus, Ephesus was kind of the center, uh, and uh, Timothy was probably involved with, or possibly involved with the church at, at uh, Colossae and Thyatira. You know, well, let me just let me just show you that map, uh, let's see. I'm not sure this will show all of it, but I think it does. It'll show, yeah, look at this whole area here. Um, all right, here's Ephesus. And this, this whole area right here, the western wow. part of Asia Minor, there's Colossae, there's Laodicea, yeah. Ephesus, Miletus, which is where Paul met the elders from Ephesus when he was on his way back to Jerusalem, Philadelphia, Sardis, Smyrna, the, the seven churches of of, uh, of of Revelation. Yeah, um, I mean, huh. I mean, look at this, and and there's not that you know, hundred miles, couple hundred miles, and uh, I, I'm not ready to walk a hundred miles, but it was you know, it, it was nothing to those guys. Yeah. And, you know, we can't get a guy, we can't let a, a, a young man, uh, you know, who's, who's 18, get a, uh, <laughs> a sermonette. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Now, now, Titus, he's another one. He wasn't all that old. I don't have his age in front of me, but he was sent to Crete, which is a nasty place. There yeah, were nasty people in Crete. Emily Pagan. Yeah, and and by the way, uh, if if you if you read back in Numbers, I believe, maybe Deuteronomy, uh, when when Israel was 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 going into uh, the Promised Land, the Canaanites had come from Crete. That's what their history says. So I'm not going. Wow. I'm not going to question that. But uh, you know, uh, the, the Canaanites were so mean and hard to get along with. Well, it's because they came from Crete, and and one of the philosophers wrote one time. He wrote, "Nothing good comes from Crete." And uh, <laughs> so you know, if that's what happened, and and I believe that that history does show that. Uh, if you look in commentaries when you're reading about the Canaanites, you will find that it it talks about Crete, and that that that's where they had originated. 
So anyway, but it was a young man that was set up to get the to whip these uh, very rough individuals, this church in this very rough region. You wouldn't just entrust that to a uh, you know a young man per se, but apparently that's that's exactly what happened. Yeah, certainly not a novice. Yeah, or a novice for that matter. Yeah, very good. So okay, <laughs> uh, that's all the history lessons I have for tonight. <laughs> Very good, Skip. Thank you, Rod. I, I enjoy it. You know, you, you all know how much I enjoy doing this and doing the research. And I learned, I learned so much. And hopefully, you know, I can impart uh, correct knowledge to <laughs> to everyone. And uh, anyway, listen. Uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, let's see who all is on here. Thank you very much. Good night. I, I was going to say, Henry. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, uh, you can report. Yes, back. very informative. Thank you. You you can report back to Mike that I didn't say anything heretical. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, that's it, Mr. Right. Reedy. You got any comments? No. Good job. Um, Got one chapter left, so that's not very much to think about before we have to start in something else. Oh, that's right. We need to. We, I should have done that before. Well, we can uh, see where we're going from here. Uh, we we could do Hebrews. Um, well, I tell you what, Hebrews. I don't know if I can do Hebrews again, one after the other. That's that's a well. We we could go in. We can talk about it, but we could go into something maybe like Galatians or, or whatever too, for that matter. Yeah, what what we might want to do is is to uh, start going back chronologically. Uh, you know, he went to Galatia first, and uh, so anyway, we, we can talk about it. We've got another week. Okay. And uh, okay, well, good to see everybody. Thanks, Kip. You have a good night, everyone. Y'all too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.